And now, Carl, I don't think I've ever interviewed somebody with whom I have so much in common. We are both Welsh, born in South Wales, did all sorts of the same sorts of things. We were mad about jazz yes. when we were youngsters. Yes. I suspect you and I have met, well, I know we've met each other since, but I bet you and I were in the same theatre when Duke Ellington, that great jazz giant, performed in yes, Cardiff. Yes, yes, we would have been at the Capital Capitol Theatre. That's it? That's it, it was, yeah. That's it? And that would have been, I left Cardiff in 1966, so uh-huh. it would have been either then or the year before, or the year before that or whatever. It would have been about 66, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. What converted you to classical music? Assuming you describe what you subsequently did as classical. Yes. Well, uh, my father was a music teacher in Pink Cloud and a, a chapel uh, organist and choir master. So I was born in 44, um, and he introduced me to... It was a day of vinyl. Vinyls come round again nowadays. Yes, it's happening. So yeah. it was the first first uh, outing of vinyl, really. And he built up a large record collection of great classical composers, mm-hmm. uh, usually the Germanic tradition, Austrian as well, from kind of Bach through Mozart, Brahms, onwards Mahler, uh, Wagner. And uh, this was my daily kind of listening, in a way. Uh, and he taught me the piano at early age. I didn't... Well, I kind of took to it, but I was never a, any kind of prodigy or, you know, not that skillful at it. But I worked at it, and uh, so I was always in that world, and I always wanted to be a musician. But my journey took me to all kinds of odd places. So I did Soft Machine, and then it started in the mid-60s, I think, and I came in, in uh, just before 1970, I think. Um, and then I became kind of multi-instrumentalist playing oboe, saxophone, and some keyboards. Uh, it wasn't a... F- it's, it's hard for me to quantify, because it, it wasn't a, a kind of band that everyone knew, you know, like Pink Floyd or whatever. But um, it was known on the underground scene, as it were, and it had a lot big following in Europe and in America. So one of my fellow bandsmen in Sophie, Mike Ratledge, he was a founding member. He was a keyboard player. And we we formed a company called Jenkins Ratledge, uh, and we were open to all offers, musical, mm-hmm. and uh, Delta Airlines asked me to do something, and we, I wrote this um, thing that became known as um, Adiemus. <laughs> And it had some resonance globally. That's even, an even understatement, had the Amos became... Yeah, but even to places like Japan, well, De- Delta didn't fly, you know, they, they became aware of it. And record companies came calling and they said, can we release it as a single? And I said, well, can I develop the idea and do an album uh, with my gratitude? And I, that's what we did. And what, just describe what, for those few people out there who don't know what it is, what, what, sort of music would you now describe Adi Amos as, as Well, Adi Amos means many things. Uh, and it was a unique sound and it was, there was something spiritual about it. And I was, people said it was, it was spiritual music for secular people was a kind of hook they put on. And in Japan, it was known as healing music. And we had a meeting at, um, at the record company and around this board, board meeting table kind of thing. And, uh, because it had no name at that point. Mm. So they said, what should we call it? And I didn't know. And so someone said, shall we look at some of the lyrics? So then they came across Adi Amos. I said, that's a good name. Lon- With no words? N- not on that, not on Adi Amos, no. There, mm. there was text. When I did the original Adi Amos, it was a, it was a rush job, and I thought they, want, they wanted someone to sing. And um, so I thought, well, I, I haven't got time to research text or anything. So I made up, much like Scott sings in jazz, going, you know, ba doo ba doo bap ba doo ba doo bap bap that kind of thing. I kind of formulated text, invented phonetics, really, uh, uh-huh. and uh, like I did then, but not yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so that became the text for Adi Amos. And that, I did all level Latin, but I didn't know, I didn't know what Adi Amos meant, but it did approximate to something like, we will draw near. Like we will draw people near, which is a very appropriate name in a way, because I had no idea it could be something horrendous, you know, something that offended 
Yeah, the faiths or whatever, you know. But music is meant to draw people near, yeah, isn't exactly. it? That's the whole point. No, exactly. Yeah. So that, that worked really well. And uh, that was the beginning of it. And uh, off we went. When you sit down and look at a blank sheet of paper, figuratively speaking, what are you setting out to do? To write something that passes my test, whatever that is, my personal test. And what, it, what might that test be? It's just what I think has quality. I could write something, and I think it's of a certain standard that I let it go out into the world, you know, if you like. So you're not saying to yourself, I wonder what they would like to hear. Never. Never? Never. How interesting. So you Because I don't think you can second guess what people want, and I don't do that. An awful lot of people do exactly that. Yes. I mean, my main mission, if you like, is to write something on my standard and make a connection with people. Uh, I wouldn't be the kind of composer if you wrote something. Like people have done it. They write a symphony, they put it in a drawer, and then they write another one that's in the bottom drawer, you know. And I wouldn't do that. It's not fulfilling, really. So the fact I have an audience, not that I crave it, but it's it's some kind of recognition. One critic said to me once that my music was emotionally manipulative. Well, manipulative. I think, well, I think it's a fantastic compliment to, to say that I can move people with my music. That's what he's saying. I can bring people to tears or make them laugh or whatever, you know. Well, you obviously have succeeded massively. I mean, the most played conductor in the modern world. I mean, you've been staggeringly successful with the classic FM audience. They love you. They put you in the Hall of Fame. And the, I mean, heavens. Yeah, no, the, the station has been very, very kind to me. But uh, I don't think I say kind. Well, but they like you. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's <laughs> what I'm trying to say. I mean, they think you're wonderful. <laughs> but, so what, what, what do you want your music to do for people? when they listen to it. Well, lots lots of my music, since the Arm Man, which I was commissioned to write after Adi Amos, that led to the Arm Man in the year 2000. So I was commissioned in 1998 by Classic FM. There were three partners, the, the Music Charitable Trust, Classic FM, and the Royal Armouries that run the Tower of London. And they wanted a work masterpiece for the millennium, hoping for a better future and a future uh, of peace and hopefulness, but that didn't last. I mean, I wrote the work, it was premiered, and then we were back. And that was dedicated to, because that was the conflict as I was composing in 19, 1998, 1999, uh, the war in the Balkans. So it was dedicated to the victims of Kosovo. Mm. And then subsequently I went there and did a concert and all that. So since then, apart from many of the sacred works that composers from the past um, wrote like Requiem and Stabat Mater. Um, I set those words for different albums but with a uh, with a slight twist the Christian text was used but then I delved for text in other religions or sources that said the same message but in a in a different way and that was important then I became known as a falling that composer of peace because I did a work called The Peacemakers where the five main texts were from Martin Luther King, uh, Gandhi, Dalai Lama, uh, Mother Teresa, and Nelson Mandela. Uh, quotes from them, and then other texts from different people, and some text, especially written. And I was about peace. And then my later one, last year, One World, that's about the planet, how we came here, both from a cosmological perspective and also from a Abrahamic religion perspective, Old Testament and all that. And that deals with um, the text deals with uh, ecology and issues and the climate and all that. Some about slavery, others about mendacious politicians. Uh, it's quite a mix of text. But, uh, and that's, uh, we did a premiere in Linz last November, Linz, uh, Brooklyn House in Linz. Before 2016, I was asked to write a piece um, to commemorate 50 years 
since the Aberfan disaster. I remember it very well. I was yeah. there when the miners were digging through the rubble for their children and the tears were running down their blackened faces and it was the most awful thing I've ever seen in my life and I've been a journalist for many, many years. There's one movement there where the adult choirs chant the children's names and the children in the choirs chant the ad- adults' names and it moves into Benedictus. And at the end of that, Brent Helver ends the movement with Buried Alive by the National Coal Board, which is what they read out in the court court case later, I think. Sorry, extremely powerful. It was a close up of his face, you know, intoning this, this line and it was hugely um evocative and yeah, so it's 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 vivid in our memory. And I quote from the beginning of that Benedictus, he quotes from Mavano by by Parry, um, because apparently at some point uh, rescuers sang that song. I don't know whether well, it's for, for me the most beautiful Welsh song, but I'm I'm hopeless romantic. And no, uh, it is wonderful. It, it's wonderful. It is wonderful isn't yeah, it? it is wonderful. Yeah. You're never going to stop, are you? You're going to no. Be, I, I think it's a bit. Carry on. I say it's a bit of a hobby, but <laughs> in a way, it's a, bit, it's a bit of a drug, really, or <laughs> something. But do you enjoy it still? I, I do, I do. It, it keeps and, me going, I guess, I suppose. And what have you not done that you want to do? Is there anything left? Is there any? You, you've broken a lot of new ground um, in, in, in your life as a composer. Is there anything that you want to do that you have not so far done? No, the only thing I, re- I regret not doing, I suppose, would be something, a long piece, and it's too speculative to do, do off spec, a long piece for um, like an opera or a, or a musical theatre piece, something with words, singing, and uh, you know, with orchestra, theatre piece really, but sung. Uh, but uh, I don't crave doing that, you know. You've got plenty of time, you're only 80. <laughs> oh, heavens, <laughs> it's, it's not, not as if you're old or anything, is it? <laughs> What's, what are you most proud of? Don't, and don't be modest, you know, but just what, what, what do you look back on? on your long career and say, yeah, I'm glad I did that. Well, there are odd things. I don't... I, w- I was kind of proud to have a piece played at the recent coronation of, of Charles. Course. Yeah, so that was because, not because of personal reasons, but it was like being... When the procession came through and all, it's like being uh, a part of history, really, being there. Because I saw, I saw his mother's coronation when I was nine. In the village of Penclough, when I, I was I when I was watching born. it on the television, yeah, and I watched splot it. a neighbour's <laughs> little tiny black and white television. That's the, it, uh, twelve-inch television, yeah. black and white. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, I think, I was nine then at yeah. the time. Uh, so I, I, when I said I found it remarkable that I was, whatever, how many years later, yeah. um, I was in there listening to a piece that he commissioned from me when he was Prince of Wales. Really? A harp concerto for Cap- Catherine Finch, Welsh harpist. Ah. So it's been pretty positive most of the time. Been more than positive, hasn't it? I mean, you have been one of the most successful composers of your generation. Some would say the most. No, I've, I've had a good run, really, and um, it's not ended yet. Good to hear that. Sir Carl Jenkins, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Love John. It's been a pleasure. For me too. Thank you. It. Yeah, it's fantastic. And and Ellington was a serious composer. Oh, he was. Yeah, he's fantastic. He's one of the greats, and different to everything else, really. Mm. And that moment in the Ellington concerts when he would, they were all there on stage, all the musicians, and then he would walk on stage and he'd sit at the piano and he'd play the, the opening bars of "You Can Take the A Train," and then they all join yeah. in and didn't yeah. that make the hair on the back of your head yeah up. for years i did know that the a train was a train from midtown manhattan up to harlem yes exactly. <laughs> yeah, it'll take you all the way to harlem yeah yes exactly yeah <laughs> yeah indeed what a song